What's up dudes and dudettes, my name is Swampwater, and growing up I have always adored party games. Connect 4, oh, Paddleship, God. Russian Roulette, you name it, I played it. But I have also loved video games, and thankfully Nintendo were the masters at making them, dropping players into immersive worlds with wacky rule sets and action that you simply can't achieve from any other medium. But each fall, a new entry in one of my favorite party game series is released, that being the Jackbox Party Packs, collections of 5 unique party games that all use your smart devices as your controller. Now you don't have to use the greasy cheap third party controller to play party games with your buds on the TV. And since even your granny probably has one of these things nowadays, anybody can hop in and give it a try. And although I think anyone can enjoy Jackbox Party Pack games, not all the packs and games are built equally. And since I am one of the loonies that invested a lot of time and money into the series, I will be ranking each game and pack from worst to best, even including the three games given in the pre-release demo of the new Party Pack 9. But of course, these are all just my opinions. And even though I'll try to acknowledge the positives of a game, even if I personally don't care for them, my rankings will be different than other people's. And if you notice things that I didn't mention in the video that made you like a game more or less, please do comment them down below. Also, I am so sorry to all the people who have been waiting centuries for my next FNF video. This was originally going to be a short break from FNF content to add variety on my channel, but it ended up taking a lot of time and energy out of me. But if you want to see more videos like this in the future, the best and easiest way to show that support is just by leaving a like on the video. And if you have any other video suggestions you would like to see, I highly recommend commenting them down below or suggesting it in my Discord server since I check both regularly. Now before we begin, let's get everyone up to speed. Back in the ancient days of the 1990s, oh. when cool was first invented and English was born, Jackbox Games, formerly known as Jelly Vision Games, created a popular PC game themed all around a game show called You Don't Know Jack, which even got a real TV show and way too many sequels. Sadly though, in the 2000s with the rise of consoles and denim, a PC trivia game had no way to survive, and after failed attempts at trying to capture the console market, Jellyvision went to go get some milk. And unlike most fathers, Jellyvision returned better than ever with a reboot to the franchise and a simplified Facebook version of the game. But this was not enough to save the company, and after failed investments in the mobile market and an ultimate sequel that ended up releasing on a dying console that was more fun to piss on than to play, the newly renamed Jackbox was already dying just barely after their revival. But Jackbox would eventually merge off their tragic path one day with a unique concept using one of their failed mobile games, Lie Swatter. People waiting before a movie in the theater could play a massively multiplayer version of the game where everyone in their seats could join in on a website and compete at true or false trivia questions. Test groups had overwhelmingly positive ratings for the idea, but theater companies on the other hand felt otherwise. Playing these games was using up potential ad time, so Jackbox was promptly turned down. But Jackbox realized that they could avoid all the negatives of using ad time by just selling the games like they already were with You Don't Know Jack. With the remaining money they had, Fibbage was born, completely designed around this fantastic device's controller idea. And after deciding that a pack of five games could sell at a higher price than just one game, the first Jackbox Party Pack was born using enhanced versions of prior games they made, along with a Fibbage-like game with drawings and very cheap to produce video and audio design. Oh, and don't forget about this potato that lost its ability to sing from the original concept. I know all this path do you name. Oh well. As you can assume, this became a tremendous success. And after eight packs with the ninth one around the corner, here we are today. Now with the very necessary history lesson done, let's start the ranking. Now the first category we will be looking at is of the frustrating games. Thankfully there aren't too many of them, and I do understand how much work it takes to make one of these games, but thanks to heavy downfalls and critical issues in every inch of these games, I put these at the bottom. Rooting back to pack 1 where dreams come to die is Word Spud. It's pretty much universally agreed that this is one of if not the worst Jackbox games ever made, with even the developers mocking Word Spud in later games. Sorry Fighting Flower 2, it is that bad. In this game you continue off of a word, like pan for example. You might turn pan into pancake. If your friends like it, then the next word becomes a continuation of the continuation, aka pancake turns into cake. 
then the next player might turn cake into cake face. Face becomes face plant, plant becomes something else, you get it. The issue is, is that this is not fun at all. No music, no gameplay, no energy, no art, no comedy, not even a game host. Just a complete waste of time. Even though nothing this game has is flawed. Because players can reject any and all answers to prevent people from getting more points at no consequence. At least things go up from here. Launching to the second worst game is Zeeple Dome from Party Pack 5. Now Jackbox likes to experiment with unique ideas using the phones as controller mechanic all the time. Text to speech, co-op, it's great seeing Jackbox not just making safe games they know will do well. But this game doesn't just experiment with what phones can do. This game experiments how playable a game can be when it does everything phones can't do. Yes, there is limitations to the phones as controllers mechanic. Number one, games might have slight lag. Thankfully, most Jackbox games don't force players to react quickly or force players to time their button pressing. Except Zeeple Dome, which has you aiming and shooting at enemies while they move around shooting projectiles. And number two, it is hard to press things on your phone while looking at the screen. Once again, Jackbox games usually have you look at the TV and your phones at separate times, but not at the same time. Zeeple Dome laughs at this and says, good luck, punk. Watch where you aim from two different screens, loser. Imagine if you had to look at your controller each time you fired your gun in a shooter game. Congrats, you've pretty much just played Zeeple Dome. It's not all bad. Hitting enemies can feel super satisfying when the game decides to not screw you over. And the tension before each match is amazing. I love how you can hear the crowd above you as you get ready for the next match. As someone who's been an actor in theater plays, the 30 minutes before a performance is maximum dread. And the tension remains here in this game. I really love it. it. Really immerses me into the experience. Finally, I love the animation and art style. It's clean, mean, and supreme. But despite that, this game is subjectively garbage. Sorry. The next category is the, sure, I guess I'll try it out, games category. These games are super good, but are usually unplayed due to the much better options Jackbox provides. Graffitiing on up is Civic Doodle from Party Pack 4. I used to think this game was as bad as people who don't return their shopping carts, but honestly, I now think it's a little bit better than that. More on the level of breaking all the bones in your body at once. To all the people who played the Doodle game before, you know how you have to use your imagination to fill out a full drawing based on solely a pen stroke. Jackbox takes this to the next level by having the same pen stroke get given to two different players, with people voting who made the better drawing. This game has such a creative concept and core, but the game designers probably got drunk after celebrating such a good game idea and made the rest of the game while intoxicated. The music, sound effects, and host all scream, so silly. Listen to these sounds. So goofy. Don't be all serious and grumpy. It's goofball time. One of the only Jackbox soundtracks I actively dislike. Also, the final round is flawed and breaks constantly. How is this not fixed before launch? Don't get me wrong, this game is pretty decent, but there's much better drawing games you can play. Spinning to the next slot in this category is The Wheel of Enormous Proportions from Party Pack 8. The only trivia party game with a wheel of enormous proportions. Trivia games aren't fun for everyone, and Jackbox Games figured that out a long time ago. Fibbage tries to fix this by making half of the fun be decepting others, while Trivia Murder Party, which we'll talk about more later, uses deadly intense minigames. And this game tries to solve it once more using a different technique, picking a winner by random chance, which is not fun for anybody, the winner and the losers. Thankfully, this game does have its redeeming qualities, being that the game does look and sound really nice. And I don't mind the idea of some luck being in Jackbox games, but I feel like this takes it a little bit too far, where it feels like a whole bunch of wasted time just to find out a random winner. And yes, I know, the better you are at the trivia, the more likely you are to win, but that just makes it even worse when the person who is good at trivia ends up losing. Buzzing to the next spot on this list is Lyswater from Party Pack 1. It was kind of tough for me to pick between the wheel and Lyswater, but I do think the foundation of this game is a lot more solid, fair, and entertaining. Pick true or false, get shocked by the answers. For Jackbox, technically first attempt at phones as controllers, not bad. Not bad at all. Sigging into this placement is Joke Boat from Party Pack 6. Make up random words, use other players' words in the setups of corny jokes, and then make a punchline. 
Honestly, good luck trying to make something funny using a setup like, how many blanks do you need to screw in a light bulb? It's so hard to be remotely funny in this game. Most games, I guarantee, will be full of... Eh, I guess this joke isn't as bad as the other one. Just like my channel. And it's such a shame because the presentation of this game is actually pretty funny. And the stand-up comedy aspect is brilliant. But stand-up comedy games are only funny when you can actually be funny. <clears throat> be funny now. <clears throat> Also, I know this doesn't really matter, but this menu feels like a complete afterthought. I really enjoy the final round of this game. In the final round, you have to one-up someone else's older joke. The tougher their joke is to beat, the more you'll get if you're funnier. Finding the next spot on this list is Dictionarium from Party Pack 6. Make funny definitions to made-up sounding words. Then make a funny synonym of the word, aka a funny fake word with the same definition. It's kind of pointless having a leaderboard each round since not too much happens in this game, but oh well. It's very short, but it's not too terrible. And is it just me, or did they completely remake the structure of this game? I swear this game was completely different and a lot worse at launch, but maybe it's Mandela Effect, I don't know. Testing on up is Role Models from Party Pack 6. This game has you compare your friend's personality traits to cast from TV shows, food toppings, and more. Like a glorified BuzzFeed quiz. You gain points by predicting what other people would compare you to, and I don't really care for it all too much. I think it's because the game itself is trying to be the comedy source instead of the players. But overall, it's not too bad, just not really my thing. Next is You Don't Know Jack 2015. The series that started it all! You Don't Know Jack is an excellent party game, but not an excellent Jackbox party game. The game introduces a lot of ideas to players, which eventually become a common staying, but when you only play one or two games at once, everything just feels kinda random and out of nowhere. Like the game's throwing ideas at the wall and seeing what's sticking. Rather than in previous You Don't Know Jack games, where if you stayed in for the long haul, you kinda understood what the game was trying to go at. The main idea of this game is each question is phrased with lots of red herrings, like making the question sound super specific when it's really not. For example, the question about what percentage of Kim Kardashian's brain is made up of just water. The specific detail about it being Kim Kardashian's brain instead of just saying a human brain is supposed to trip you up, while also being a jab at Kim Kardashian implying they are just water brain. This game is one of the most clever Jackbox titles even including a whole category of questions centered around all the answers being either Kangaroo, Peanut, Albert Einstein, or Uranus, which somehow can get shockingly tough to pick between. Sadly, this game was designed with the Ouya controller in mind, not a phone, so you have to answer by pressing four face buttons, as if it were a traditional controller. As it is, it's pretty fun, but it doesn't really fit alongside the other Party Pack games. Hopping along is Junktopia from the new Party Pack 9 demo. In almost every discussion I saw of Pack 9, it seemed like the majority of people thought that this would be the backseller, and although I think it could easily be with minor changes, there are just a few things in the finished build that kinda kills the experience for me. For starters, why is the soundtrack in this game so mellow? As you'll see me point out a lot later in this video, I like it when games skyrocket the energy in the room. A funny premise and structure can only work if the mood is lively. I wouldn't say the music is bad at all, it just doesn't match the energy the game needs. Even something like Seabat in the background would elevate this game tenfold. Anyway, the game itself is about coming up with different uses and taglines for bizarre items. I love this game, and the concept is way better than I imagined it would be. But sadly, the music here is better suited for studying than trying to amuse others. Blasting to the next spot is Bomb Corp from Party Pack 2. This is actually the first and one of the only Party Pack games to be co-op. Your goal is to work together to defuse a ticking time bomb by reading instructions on each of your devices. Rules can contradict with each other, so it's important to see whose set of rules came before other players' rules. A rule might say cut all green wires, but another rule might say all even numbered green wires are stinky so they become yellow. Yet a third rule might say cut all yellow wires if there are more than two stinky wires. And at the end, rule 4 just says you need to subscribe to Swamp Water. Working together and not jumping the gun is key to surviving the deadly desk job in this game. Sadly, this game was made with a four-player cap, which I assume was to prevent things from getting too chaotic and hard to manage, 
But I think this could be fixed by having a team mode where two teams race to defuse 10 increasingly difficult bombs. I would love to see this. In fact, I think all party pack games should have more than just the standard one or two modes. Anywho, although the dialogue is really funny in this game, having to rehear the audio over and over again when you and your friends keep blowing up at a specific task can get really annoying. If a Jackbox employee is listening to this right now, please, 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 please this please, one please, please. really needs a sequel. Tallying up to the next placement is the pull mine for Party Pack 8. Guess other players' opinions about certain subjects to gain torches in this cold, dangerous cave. Sometimes you must predict the most popular answer, sometimes least popular, second most popular answer, it's all about knowing your players' opinions. This game doesn't really work with a two-player minimum though, in fact, like most polls, it really does need a large sample base to be at all accurate and hard to guess. With two players, half of the votes are your own, which means you already know the more likely sways of the answers. I think the minimum player count should be around five people. I know that's a bit high for Jackbox games, but any less makes your votes way too significant. Maybe a four-player minimum would be fine, but that's honestly a bit of a stretch. Overall, I think that this game has excellent art and beautiful music, but I think by making this a two-player minimum, it kind of hurts what this game has going for it. Reaching the next bracket is, well, Bracketeering from Party Pack 4. This game revolves around you making a funny response to a prompt, which will be put in a tournament to be the king or queen of all responses. This can be fun while streaming, but with friends, it's just alright. Having to see a joke repeatedly, just because it's the funniest, it's not super ideal, but it's still a great head-to-head -head game. Hypothetically, next on the list should be Split the Room from Party Pack 5. Your goal is to fill in a blank to a yes or no question which will cause the most amount of controversy. The more even the votes are, the more points you'll get. You also get points by making tough decisions for players. I love hypotheticals. Some people find it annoying, saying, if it wouldn't happen, why does it matter? And I really do not understand that. I think the fun of hypotheticals is hearing people explain why they would pick their decisions. But that's not Jackbox's fault, that's humanity's fault. I do think this game would be a lot more engaging if they put more energy into the music and visuals, but even better would be to add would you rather questions to the main section of the game instead of only lame yes or no questions. Charading the next spot is Blather Around from Party Pack 7. Party Pack 7 is fantastic, but this is definitely the most forgotten entry. It's charades, but instead of gestures, you make sentences using a limited pool of words and sentence structures. It's heavily luck-based, but trying to figure out the prompt and seeing how different people interpret the hints, it's pretty great. Only major thing I'd change is allowing an extended timer setting. Most Jackbox games have an extended timer setting, but this one for some reason doesn't. I think it's because the timers linked to the point distribution system, but come on, these timers can be way too short, especially with less players. So I kinda like the option for maybe double the time with double the points being distributed, but I doubt that's gonna happen. Stabbing the next one on the list is Weapons Drawn from Party Pack 8. This game is easily the most complex title so far in Jackbox history. And sadly, the tutorial makes it seem even more complicated than it already is by trying to explain every single mechanic along with a plot reason why the mechanics exist. In summary, you must hide a randomly selected letter from your name in two different drawings, and the other players will try to find the matching letter in both of your drawings, linking the person's two drawings together. Some letters are harder to hide than others, and the smallest you can make your letter is way too big to disguise it in unique ways, but the animation, art style, music, host, mechanics, everything is fun and unique from any other Jackbox game. Plus in round 2 your letters will be sloppier and in handwriting, allowing you to hide them better if you have sloppy drawing skills. Which is a cool thing that they really didn't have to do, but I think it really enhances the gameplay experience. Overall, good game, but complex rules. Howling on up is Monster Seeking Monster from Party Pack 4. Before I actually talk about the game, I just want to say this is some of the best music in any Jackbox game. Round 1 through 6, the credits music, I love it all. After your first playthrough of the game, it should be obvious how this isn't just a game about sexting, but this is actually a very deep and complex strategy game. The sext aspect is just a hook to get you to play along to understand truly how to play and win. Each player will have a secret monster identity, the true goal of the game being to outsmart other monsters by dating the right people and avoiding the others. Plus, with low player counts, you can play with the robot 
who adds a whole new layer to the gameplay. If the robot ends up in last place by the end of the game, the robot becomes heartless, destroys all humanity, and nobody wins. Do you risk yourself losing to prevent the robot from getting last? Do you date the robot to prevent another monster from dating them? There's dozens of different reasons to date or avoid the robot, and I wish there was an option for it to be in higher player count games. Sadly, the one thing bringing this game down is that most people get sick of the game before the whole strategy aspect of the game is realized by players. So to most people, the game is just a game where you sexed for 20 minutes and then it's over. And in that viewpoint, it really overstays its welcome. Sadly, you can only have a small amount of text per round, which doesn't allow for much discussion amongst the other players. I think instead of tying a certain amount of messages per round, it should be a certain amount of messages per player in each round. Overall though, super underrated. And if you ever decide to get packed 4, give this game a try. Next category is the great games. These games are, well, great. Not trying out these games if you own them is shooting yourself in the foot. However, if you don't own these packs, I don't really think it's worth buying these packs over. Also, I just want to take a little break to say I hope you are enjoying the video. I don't think this one's gonna get as many views, but I really wanted to make a Jackbox video for the longest time. So please, if you want to support my channel, like the video and subscribe so I can make more videos like this in the future. Please save me from my FNF hell. I can't escape. I can't. Es Next is the eraser hating drawing game of Drawful from Party Packs 1 and 8. This game has you try to draw a prompt, then other people have to try to make a believable guess on what the prompt originally was. All the fake answers plus the real prompt will be put on screen. Your goal is to find the real prompt out of all the player's guesses. Be careful, some prompts will unpurposely have spelling errors in order to be hard to find. And there's a reason this game is called Drawful. You are unpurposely not given an eraser or an undo tool, so if you screw up, it's up to you to try to make the best with the mess you've created. I understand why you aren't given correction tools, but I do think it would be a cool mechanic if you could undo, but it just snatched points each time you hit the button. Oh, by the way, Jackbox Games, if you're watching this, uh, just, just skip forward a few seconds, uh, d don't worry about it, just, just, just skip like 30 seconds or so, d it, it's fine, it's fine, just, just right now, okay, okay, I think they're gone, okay, dudes, dudes, dudes. It's, it's conspiracy time. This conspiracy is bigger than Dictionarium being remade after launch, and even bigger than the secret code to unlock the pull mine timer in the upcoming Jackbox game rumoring. This conspiracy, if revealed, might get me killed by the Jackbox overseers. The newest Drawful sequel, Drawful Animate, I suspect is a direct response to the competitor Gartic Phone, a Jackbox style party game that got extremely popular in 2020. Both are about animation and both feature a simple colorful design. This is beyond enough evidence to convince me of anything. There is no universe where this cannot be a coincidence. Jackbox, I'm onto you. You cannot stop me. I will reveal all of your secrets. Oh, hey Jackbox, you're back, you're back. How's it been, how's it been? Yeah, yeah, you didn't miss much. You didn't miss much. Um. Let's, let's move on. Returning five years after the last game is You Don't Know Jack full stream from Party Pack 5. You Don't Know Jack is now being presented on a morally questionable and sometimes evil streaming service called Binge Pipe. This game honestly works so much better as a Party Pack game than 2015 did. Instead of a button pad, thankfully your phone will now have proper buttons, displaying the text of each answer instead of A, B, X, Y. This game also features faster pacing and updated mechanics that works a lot better with the brand new 8 player maximum. Sadly, I feel this entry is the most basic trivia game feeling. I think they should have bring back some of the design concepts from the Facebook game, having less questions and some of the cool ideas they had, but overall not a bad entry. Making noise in the next position is Earwax from Party Pack 2. This game is literally just Cards Against Humanity slash Apples to Apples, except with sound effects instead of cards. I could see why people think this game is pretty lame, but with my crude humor, I really enjoy the sound effects. And it is random chance what sound effects you are given, which makes this game kind of luck-based, but I do think that makes it a nice low skill barrier for other players, and card games kind of do that anyway, so why pick on Earwax? Powering up is non-sensory from the Pac-9 demo. I was eager to see what exactly this game would be about, and it was exactly what I thought it would be about. Come up with a title or drawing that you think a blank percentage of on a prompt. The closer others guess to the correct percentage, 
the more points you and them get. There are several creative variations of this idea, and I would describe it kind of like gespionage if the polls were just based on one player's opinions and bias. However, there are a couple shortcomings, although not nearly as detrimental as Junktopia's was. This is Jackbox's second or third attempt at using 3D animation in the forefront. And although push the buttons animation was simple enough that it worked well, the host in this game looks kinda off. And I doubt this was a creative decision, more of a limitation of 3D animation being a little out of their field. Thankfully, you only see the host for 5 or so seconds in a total of like 20 minutes in a game, so it doesn't really matter. Also, for some reason, the drawing in this game is kinda laggy, and the final product for some reason can have weird gaps in it, which is something I never experienced in any other Jackbox game, so I'm kind of unsure why it happened here. But overall, a pretty fun party pack title, with a few hairballs that are manageable to cough up. From hell and back, next on up is the devils in the details from Party Pack 7. Long ago, there was a running joke that Jackbox Games was creating a game called Everybody Help Grandma. This lasted for many years, and during April Fool's Day, Jackbox announced Everybody Help Grandma would be the new title for the upcoming, at the time, Party Pack 6. Even though it was an April Fool's Day joke, many people loved the idea of the game, competing to do mini-game tasks to help Grandma, with the winner being the one who helped out the most. At least that's what players thought the gameplay would be at the time. But sadly, as said, this was just a continuation of the Everybody Help Grandma joke, and was not really a new game for Party Pack 6. Until April Fool's Day the next year, where they announced Everybody Help Grandma was coming back with a brand new title, The Devils and the Details. But since the date was April 2nd, not April 1st, they now apparently legally had to make the game, according to whatever laws are in this Jackbox universe going on here. It was very unclear if they were being serious or not about releasing this game, but yep, they actually did it. They made a joke into an actual party pack game, and a really decent one at that. One difference between what everybody thought Everybody Help Grandma would be and this game is that you don't just gain points from being helpful, you now gain points for doing selfish tasks, if you can get away with it. This is probably the most fun April Fool's Day joke I have ever played. Alright, before I reveal the next game, I just wanted to say that I somehow managed to skip this game when recording my lines. I have no idea how that happened. I just started talking about one game, scrolled all the way past it in my script, and then started talking about the next one. Stalking us in the next rank is Gespionage from Party Pack 3. Remember Pole Mine? Well, this is that, but better. On a player's turn, they will have to guess a certain percentage of people that fit the prompt. Like, for example, what percentage of people have kissed their pet mouth to mouth? After the player makes their selection, everyone else guesses whether they think the real percentage is higher or lower. The closer the player is to the exact percentage, the more points they get. And if other players correctly guess higher or lower, they get points too. There's also a cool feature that comes up where you can guess if you think someone's guess is way off and get double the points if correct. This game also has one of the best matching final rounds in Jackbox history. It's different from the other rounds, but doesn't fall flat. Or be like Split the Room, where the final round is more fun than the actual main portion of the game. But sadly, Gespionage has a big flaw. I do think each question uses global data like it claims, but these survey questions were definitely mostly answered by just Americans which I think is a very important detail. I think to fix this issue in a sequel, a question should specify what percentage of people in Japan have ridden a bicycle, or what percentage of Americans have seen a drive-in movie. Each question could have a hundred different variants with different percentages, and it would be a lot more accurate data this way. Anyways, I have no idea how I managed to skip this game. I just went the full way through the video, completed everything, and at the very end I was like, wait a second, but oh well, this is Gespionage right here. Super beautiful. Yeah. Standing up to the next spot is Talking Points from Party Pack 7. This is undoubtedly the most stressful Party Pack game, but can also be one of the most funniest. I don't remember what I put in my script. Okay. So, um, in this game, there's improv and you have to be funny on the fly, which can be a little stressful because things can get very awkward if you are not very funny. Um, so it's not really for everyone, it's, it's, uh, but I think extroverts will love this game. Um, 
Uh, in this game, you present a slideshow that you've never seen before. Thankfully, you aren't alone. Um, a randomly selected partner will help pick images that best explain your made-up points. Whew. Okay, it's almost over. The only notable flaw with this game, other than me melting in sweat by the end, is that the game has an award ceremony. Players make up award titles and give them to who they think deserves it the most. I love the idea of the award ceremony, but the trophies pretty much override the previous round scores, which is kind of stupid. But overall, a great game for extroverts, and if you're looking to push yourself a little bit more, this game might be the one for you. Now we are in the fantastic games category. These games are must plays. It might be worth even buying a pack over. Going once, going twice, sold to Bidiots from Party Pack 2. In this game, everyone must draw art pieces based on a prompt. Then you are given the values of a few players' art pieces, which may even be your own. Not only are you given the values of a few players' art pieces, but you're also given hints about certain players, and this can tremendously alter how you bid in this game. There's also mechanics like predatory loans, which as you can guess, gives you a loan, which you can use to outbid players a lot easier at the cost of losing some money at the end of the game. There are also the screws from You Don't Know Jack, which you can use to force another player to bid. Good for getting out of a bad decision or for screwing over a winning player. Finally, artists get more money the more people bid on their art piece, so it's good to bid on your own artwork to make it seem more valuable than it really is. But try not to be the last one bidding because you will make zero dollars if you're the one who buys your own painting. Really, really solid game. Next on up is Fibbage from Party Packs 1, 2, and 4 with 9 on the way. In this game, you have to try to make a fake believable answer to a trivia question. Just like Drawful, the goal is to find the real answer out of all the fake ones. Half of the fun in this game is seeing how absurd and made up the real answers are, like this one. And of course, the other half of the fun is tricking people into believing your lies. Fibbage 2 introduced an item called the Defibulator, which you could use to remove all but one lie, making a question a 50-50 guess. But other than that, it's pretty much the same game. Fibbage 3 removed the Defibulator, which I'm sure was to balance out the game more. Also, Fibbage 3 removed customizing your sound effect at the start of the game, but that one didn't really matter that much. In return of removing these mechanics, it has beautiful 60s visuals, music, and even the box art of the game looks amazing. The drink stain, the dust, the wear and tear, it all helps sell that this is an old game you pulled out of the attic one day. Fibbage 3 also included a new game mode called Fibbage Enough About You, the 5.5th game in Jackbox Party Back 4. Enough About You was also originally a fake joke game Jackbox said they were working on, like Everybody Help Grandma. And now I'm starting to think that Jackbox has planned these fake game names from the start, and I'm curious what other games could be coming. Add it to the list of Jackbox conspiracies. Enough About You is like normal Fibbage, but all the questions are about the players themselves making each game a lot more personal than the normal gameplay. The final round just being make a truth and lie is way too open though. I find it really difficult for me and others to come up with a new truth or lie each time. And I hope Fibbage Enough About You 2 gives more direction for the final round, like it may say, give a truth or lie about your family, or about your morning routine, to kind of switch things up a little bit and give you a sort of direction for you to go towards. Other than that, Fibbage is one of the best trivia games I've ever played. No wonder it was a big hit when it came out and pretty much saved the company. Now we are logging on to Survive the Internet from Party Pack 4. In this game you watch internet porn, I mean, <laughs> you make an honest comment about a location service app or other. Then the other players try to twist your words to make you look like a horrible person. This game is a great setup for dark humor, but there are a few major issues that cause some people to dislike it. One of the big things being people who don't use the internet super often might struggle making jokes in this game. For example, a round might be about a video sharing site like YouTube, where you have to make a video title which makes the comment look super ridiculous. Sounds simple enough, but to those who don't know how to make a video title, the joke can fall flat. Like a video titled, That's What She Said. Sorry, people who do that make me unreasonably angry. Also, some comments are really hard to work with, like being too specific, which limits the other player's options to twist your comment. Finally, jokes that are shown last have a great advantage, because they're the freshest in your mind when voting. Other than that, a really, really funny game. Wrapping up the next spot with Robots on the Drive is Madverse City from Party Pack 5. Oh god, I'm rhyming, aren't I? 
You rap against others with four funny verses. You make him like a Mad Lib, which makes things blessed. Ah, uh, no. This is terrible. I'm done with that. But yeah, in this game, you make funny raps by filling in a Mad Lib, then making a rhyming lyric to the created line. Most people dislike the rap cheering booing feature since you aren't punished for constantly booing a rap. But thankfully, as long as you have decent friends, I feel like this mechanic immerses people into the gameplay a lot more than without. Sneaking on by the next spot is Faking It from Party Pack 3. In this game, your goal is to find the sussy faker in each round. Everyone will get a prompt to like raise your hand if you haven't showered today, but the faker will get absolutely nothing. After everyone has voted, fakers must act naturally and justify their decisions. The trick is, instead of the democracy rule getting kicked out like in Among Us, this game requires a unanimous vote in order to reveal if someone is the faker or not. So even if you don't think a player is the faker, it may still be best to vote for them so then you can prove it to the other players. Despite this game being an amazing must-play, there are some odd design issues here that kinda hinder it a bit. Anyone who has played this game knows how unfair the prompts can be for the faker. A prompt can be something like, raise your hand if you have 25 atomic bombs in your attic. And even if the faker is an absolute genius, and somehow manages to make a good argument on why they not only have 25 atomic bombs in their attic, but also how they got 25 atomic bombs in their attic, it doesn't even matter because they have to vote for someone each round and yours needed the most explaining, so yours was the most suspicious anyway. And it's not like the prompts get harder and harder for the faker the longer they survive, it could literally be their first prompt and they might get screwed over completely. It's very rare to have a round where there are multiple people who sound like the faker. And the other main issue is that the game requires a very specific amount of players to be very fun and a very specific seat arrangement that not all living rooms have. But if you manage to have a game with zero BS and zero trouble setting up, this game can be super fun. I think one thing this game has over Among Us is since the faker switches every 4 or 5 minutes, it's not as stress inducing and makes it less likely for people to quit because they didn't start the game as the faker. Take that Among Us. Now we are in the flawless games category. These games are practically impossible to improve and are tremendously fun to play. I wouldn't blame you if you bought specific packs just to play these games. Cheering on to the next spot is Champed Up from Party Pack 7. First, you must draw the champion of blank. Then after finishing your first champion, you must make the underdog, who doesn't know what title they're competing for, just who they're fighting against. The champion and the underdog will compete to become the true champion, with the underdog getting bonus points if they win. This game has shockingly decent drawing tools, allowing for two layers of coloring, an undo tool, and a decent selection of colors. Plus, fighters made from previous rounds and even previous games can make a comeback, which has caused so many oh my god moments. The more games you play, the larger of a library of champions you can use. I can't really think of any flaws with this game. The stadium ring even has a white flooring, meaning if players forget to color their champions in, they are still visible. There's no way this game will not get a sequel. This is one of the most popular and praised drawing games Jackbox has ever made. And I honestly agree. Claiming the next tier is Patently Stupid from Party Pack 5. Without this game, Pack 5 would have been easy to skip out on. The idea is to solve your friend's problems with funny inventions. The voting mechanics are a little weird, I don't know why failed kickstarters punish the people who voted for them, instead of the person who pitched it, but I don't think it really matters too much. The fun thing is presenting in front of others. Also, like Survive the Internet, players who presented last do have a slight advantage, but other than that, it's a fantastic game. Very simple to understand and very fun to enjoy. Defining the next spot is Dictionarium 2. Just kidding, that won't happen. The real, real next next spot spot is Job Job from Party Pack 8. In this game, you and another player's responses will compete to see which is funnier. The more votes you get, the better the score, which we'll be talking about eventually. But there is a key design difference between these two which makes some prefer one game over the other. In Quiplash, you have to make the response completely by your own, and in Job Job, you are given a limited selection of words. There are pros and cons to both design. Pros for Job Job. It can be stressful coming up with a joke completely on your own, and having a limited selection of words can help with that. You can also blame the game for giving you unfunny words instead of blaming yourself 
for not being funny. However, cons for Job Job is that by limiting your word choice, you'll make it impossible for players to make any response they want. So if you could think of a better punchline for a joke, but the words didn't allow it, you're gonna have less of a fun time. Obviously, I enjoy Quiplash more since it's higher on the list, but it really comes down to whether you want a low skill barrier or more comedic potential. I really love how Job Job allowed for people to have a decision with how they wanted to play the style of game by trying to find more ways to make Jackbox more accessible to other players. So Jackbox, you really deserve props for this one. Coming down the belt is Quicksort from Party Pack 9's demo. At first I thought this game would be the least interesting of the ones that I played in the Party Pack 9 demo, but actually ended up being my favorite. In this game, you and your team work together to sort things from one side to the other, like Roman numeral values from smallest to largest, or planets from closest to the sun to furthest away, stuff like that. And this is probably the most enjoyable way to play a trivia game. Having to work together as a team to place things one at a time, and doing your best to leave gaps for any answers that might end up being between two responses, and most importantly yelling at each other, no, no, go that way, no, no, go this way. It's just fantastic. There's also an endless mode, which I haven't played yet, but I am so thankful that Jackbox has been more open to having multiple game modes in their games. In summary, I ended up having way more fun with this than I would have guessed. Wearing the next spot on this list is TKO from Party Pack 3. I wouldn't be surprised if this was Jackbox's most popular drawing game. It's just perfect. This is the time in Jackbox history where they just kept making bangers. In this game, you draw shirt designs, then write captions. After that, everything gets shuffled amongst players and you have to pick between the funniest designs and captions to make the ultimate t-shirt of them all. The t-shirts will compete in a tournament. The players who help make the leading t-shirt will win the game. I actually really love this system. There's no points or scoreboard in this game, so players don't need to worry if they're sucking or not. Everyone just needs to enjoy the ride. This is a very bold move. No other Jackbox game has tried this to my knowledge, but it works. Also, since there's multiple winners, more people feel the glory at the end instead of just one player. But it's not just the design of the game's mechanics, it's also super fun to create your own t-shirts. T-shirts which, might I add, you can buy in real life if you wanted. There are a few common complaints, however. The option to make your own drawings from scratch isn't available, which is kind of a shame. However, counter-argument is that you can still win if your captions and drawings are bad, making it a little bit more of a low skill barrier for certain players. Another complaint I see is the game is a little too off-paced. A lot of time is spent on the drawing and writing aspect. I feel like the more people you have, the less of a problem this is, since more shirts will be competing with no extra waiting. But yeah, with three or four players, the pacing is very off. Finally, a problem I don't see talked about a lot is that, like Civic Doodle, sometimes not all the pen strokes in your drawing will be in the final image for some reason. It's not as bad as Civic Doodle, erasing your entire image, but it can be mildly annoying. But these flaws are drowned out by all the good that comes from this game. With just a few patches to this game or a sequel, I can imagine this game being THE game to buy party packs for. And we are now in the top three, the best of the best of the best. And in third place, we have Push the Button from Party Pack 6. This game takes the highest highs of faking it, pricks off any flaws with the game, and blends its own flavor to create my favorite social deception game. Move out of the way among us, there's a new kid in town. In Push the Button, you are on a time limit to figure out who the alien imposters are before the ship is taken over. You will do this by testing players in various minigames. Any alien will have a slightly different prompt from the humans. And since it's not guaranteed you are even testing an alien during one of these minigames, it isn't wise to immediately call out who's the most suspicious and vote them out. Also, voting works in a very interesting way in this game. Any player at any time can push the button, which can call an emergency meeting. However, each player only has one button, and unlike Among Us, you only have one shot to get all the aliens out at once. If even one player ends up not being alien, or one alien still ends up remaining on the ship, the aliens win. Plus, like faking it, the vote must be unanimous, meaning most games will end up running the clock down to the final minute with everybody yelling at each other with different suspicions and reasonings. I'm voting yes! I'm voting yes! Among Us games never get to this sort of intensity, especially since the punishment of voting out a crewmate is just a slight advantage to the imposter. Unlike in this game, where there is only one vote 
one chance and screwing up means the entire game. Warnings, blazing, sweat pouring, I love this game to death. Aliens can also hack themselves or humans to flip their responses. Aliens can get human prompts, humans can get alien prompts, and it's good to take notes on what other players say, and I mean literally. Keeping track of what every player says or doesn't say might suggest who is an alien and who is not. It's also important to select tasks that are best for the situation. Some tasks are faster but don't reveal too much info about a player, and some are more likely to call out an alien or prove a human as innocent, but take much more time to complete. Remember, you are on a time limit. Thankfully, you can speed up players if you think aliens are stalling, but it is wise to keep that time in mind. Recently, I found out this game was in the works for several years, unlike most Party Pack games, which are in development for less than a year. They knew they had something priceless on their hands, and they did. I love chaotic games, and this game is very much that. An easy 10 out of 10. In second place is Trivia Murder Party from Packs 3 and 6. Remember how I said I would talk about this game eventually? Well, eventually is now here. As I said before, Jackbox learned that trivia alone is not really for everybody, so to fix that issue in this game, if you suck at trivia, you still have a chance by surviving deadly minigames. Some are luck, some are memory, some are skill, but all create tension. In early tests of the game, it was noted that dying permanently was kinda stinky. Having to wait for the game to finish just because you were dead was kinda lame, but thankfully they came up with a brilliant solution. Players who get murdered can still play, but as ghosts. Once one player is left alive and enough trivia questions have gone by, the final round will begin. It's a mad dash to the exit. For each question, you will have to select how many of the three options are true. Each correct guess will move you one step closer to the exit. And although they are in the lead, the living player only has two options, meaning they can only move at most two spaces at a time, compared to the ghost, which can move three. Once the lead runs out and a ghost passes the living player, the ghost will steal their life force and become the new living player. But don't be slow about it. The longer you take, the closer the darkness gets to you. Losing to the darkness means you are out of the game per Permanently. The final round is intense. It starts off with a looming sense of dread as the ghosts slowly catch up, but as the game goes on and on and everybody's fighting to escape, the music transitions to be killer and chaotic. And in Trivia Murder Party 2, the final exit is gated off, meaning you have to get all three responses correct to bust open the barrier. Plus, this game has a lot of unnecessary little easter eggs and details that really enhance the experience. For example, once you finish a game of Trivia Murder Party, you have the option to make a sequel with the same players or start a reboot with new players. If you choose to make a sequel, all the players that died in the last game will have their offspring compete in the game. So Swampwater will become Swampwater Jr., then Swampwater the Third, and so on. And I also think it's pretty cool how each doll in the first game represents one of the seven deadly sins. I find that's a cool detail. In Trivia Murder Party 2, there's also multiple endings. Yes, Trivia Murder Party 1 did have an alternate ending if nobody escaped, but the sequel adds loads of new endings and alternate ending sequences. The hotel exploding scene at the end can also change at random to feature fireworks, the moon exploding, a silent film variant, and many more. A Quiplash minigame can also appear in the game, and several secret live-action death screens. There's so much to unpack in this game. It's phenomenal. Speaking of Quiplash, as some may guess, the best Jackbox Party Pack game, in my opinion, is... Quiplash from Packs 2, 3, and 7. Yes, I know everybody ranks this as the best Jackbox game, or at least most sane people do, but it would be a crime if I ranked this any lower than first place. I've asked dozens of people which Jackbox game they love the most, and I rarely find anyone who ranks this any lower than first. But why, you may be asking? Well, Quiplash is all about being funnier than your opponent. Two players will be given the same prompt and must come up with a unique punchline. The prompt along with both responses will compete to see which one is funnier. Points are distributed based on the percentage of people who picked your answer. Compared to other head-to-head -head Jackbox games, this game is the most fairest and fun out of all of them. You won't even be screwed over if you get a bad prompt, since so did your only opponent. An odd player game won't pit you up against a bot, and they do this by giving two prompts to each player, meaning you will always have an even number of prompts. Responses also are shown at the same time, so both punchlines are equally fresh in your mind when voting. And even the final round is more solid than a lot of other Jackbox games. 
Usually final rounds sacrifice the solid core of the gameplay in order to be unique, but the last lash still keeps the previously mentioned qualities of Quiplash, but just changes it up a bit. Everyone gets one prompt, with all the responses getting shown at the same time. You now must distribute three votes among other players, obviously the goal being to get the most amount of points possible. And although Quiplash does pretty much everything perfectly, its sequels, however, did not. Quiplash 2, personally my favorite Quiplash game, adding safety quips which give you a jackbox made response if you are struggling to come up with anything, and player made games where you and your friends can come up with custom prompts. In a way, creating a nearly infinite amount of content to enjoy. The colors are vibrant, the animations are touched up a little, and the soundtrack really gets the energy going. Just listen to this. But Quiplash 2 did something that made many people abandon it and stick with the original. And that something is the updated Last Lash. Instead of distributing three votes among players, you will now give a gold vote, a silver vote worth less, and finally a bronze vote worth the least. Which honestly isn't a bad change, but everything else that has changed was. In Quiplash 2, there are now three different Last Lashes you may get. Acrolash, make a funny acronym from some letters. Wordlash, come up with something funny using a specific word. And Comiclash, fill in a speech bubble from a comic with something funny. The main issue with Acrolash and Wordlash specifically is that there is no setup to the punchline. And overall, just why did this replace the original Last Lash? It doesn't improve upon Quiplash 1's Last Lash, so why even bother making it this way? Quiplash 3 also changed up some things, adding the ability to choose your own character, play Jackbox made bonus content, and become... this. And it seems like Quiplash 3 was a lot more liked by the public than Quiplash 2 was. But I don't know, there are just some things that I really didn't enjoy in this threequel. I love the claymation, but the music is more goofy than energy inducing in my opinion. Kinda like what Civic Doodle was. Also, although the final round is an improvement from 2, it is still a little more janky than 1's was in my opinion. The last lash is no more. Welcome to the new Thrip Lash. Compete against an opponent with a punchline using three separate sections. It's alright, but since you only respond to one prompt this round, if you have an odd amount of players, the player in last place versus against a bot, aka the host Josh Schmitty. But even with these flaws, Quiplash 1, 2, and 3 are all sublime in their design. Easily the most fine-tuned Jackbox experience ever made. But now that we've ranked all the games, which pack is the best to purchase? I think that I'll be basing this on the variety of content in the pack, the quality of each game, and, of course, the price. But I also want to consider that if a pack has multiple games that might not be for everyone, there is a good chance that one of those few games will end up being something you enjoy. Which you'll find Jackbox Party Pack 4 has a lot of. Alright, let's do a speed round. In last place is Party Pack 1, which shouldn't be a surprise to anyone. Later packs would add fantastic features, which makes this one look severely outdated. Not to mention how the three best games from this pack would later get sequels which massively improve upon their original versions. And finally, the lack of budget really shows in this game. It is shocking how well the first pack stands today, but yeah, you might as well get other packs than this one. Seventh place is Party Pack 6. This may be shocking to a lot of people, since this pack has two games which I labeled in my top three. So why is it this far down? Well, the main issue is pack six is just a more expensive and lesser version of pack three. Yes, Trivia Murder Party 2 and Push the Button are much better than pack three's counterparts, but Joke Boat is a joke itself compared to Quiplash 2. Plus, Gespionage and TKR are leagues better than role models and Dictionarium. This was definitely the lowest point for Jackbox, and I'm so glad that they made a great return to form with their next pack. Sixth place is Party Pack 8. There's nothing really special here. How did Jackbox go from eh, to wow, to eh, but slightly better? 
Truffle Animate is pretty good, but the supporting games feel kind of off in my opinion. They all have their great ideas, but I think this game needed a little more playtesting than it really got. Pull Mine feels predictable, yet unfair at the same time somehow. The wheel does not make any player feel good when playing it, and Weapons Drawn has an overly complicated tutorial. Finally, Job Job, although my favorite in the pack, is definitely not for everyone, and it can really feel restrictive despite that being part of its design. I think there's also another big thing that hinders this pack, and that is the energy of each game, but I will get more into that when we get to the really good packs. Finally, the price. Fifth place is Party Pack 5, how fitting. I feel like everyone who has bought this pack had a different reason to. Some buy it for Madver City with its comical text-to-speech rapping, some buy it for Patently Stupid with its stand-up comedy, and nobody buys it for Zeepledome. If people did that, we'd be in an apocalypse by now. Wait. Okay, who bought Pack 5 for Zeepledome? But yeah, I suspect this pack is the reason why most people just want to have one hub for all the party pack games, because it is really hard to justify opening this pack instead of just playing one of the games in the pack that's already loaded. Literally, this is the only pack where someone requested to play a game from it, and took it back when they realized that it would mean exiting out of the pack we were currently playing. This pack is fine, but I really don't think this pack should be your first, second, or even third purchase. In fourth place is Party Pack 4, fitting again. As I said before, this pack is full of games that aren't quite for everyone, but there will almost certainly be one or two games here that you'll adore. Each one of these games are built for a certain type of person, which is very different from all other packs. When this pack came out, I remember hearing lots of controversy surrounding it. All previous packs felt like a tremendous upgrade from the last, yet Pack 4 was generally considered to be not that. But almost 9 packs now with varying qualities, pack 4 in hindsight was pretty alright. In third place is Party Pack 2. This is the first pack I would think would be a good first pack if you're wanting to try out the Jackbox experience. Quiplash Excel, Fibbage 2, a very impressive resume I must say. But where it deviates from pack 6 with its two great games, is that the three supporting games are also pretty good. There are flaws with all of them. But if any of these games got a sequel, I feel they'd be phenomenal. Mostly because they all have fantastic cores. Bomb Corp with its fun energy, Bidiots with its fun wit testing gameplay, and Earwax with its sound effect selection. Great games with great cores and pumped up with energy. In second place is Party Pack 7. So many people call this the best pack, and I was so tempted to put this in first. Jackbox really got themselves out of the downhill slope with this pack, and I really think it's because of these reasons. Number 1. During COVID, party packs were selling like crazy, allowing for a much higher increase in budget. Number 2. All these games made sure to give out the most energy possible, which Pack 8 and other packs kind of fell flat on. And finally, number 3. Pack 7 bring back Quiplash at probably the perfect time, taking a fantastic pack and putting a great cherry on top. But I think that there's just one pack that is slightly better than this one. And that being in first place with Party Pack 3. This was an oops all bangers moment for Jackbox. Jackbox went from making the first ever Party Pack to improving it with the next pack with a now higher budget, to this point where they not only were getting how to make a great party pack game, but also seeing how previous formulas Jackbox had worked on could be improved with this new format. Quiplash 2, Trivia Murder Party, Faking It, TKO, and maybe even Gespionage all feel like they were made not just as another game to put in the pack, but rather something Jackbox could even present by itself. Like, for example, I enjoyed Madverse City, but I only enjoy it as a game in Pack 5. This game was really not designed to work well as its own separate game. Pack 3 feels more like a pack of party games rather than a party pack with 5 games inside. In other other words, Pack 3 is like the difference between the Orange Box and 30 Great Games. TF2 works as its own game versus the Bombardment Bridge, which really does not. 
That is why I believe pack 3 is my favorite pack, and my pick to anyone buying their first. And with that, I would like to give my super duper, very important, official Swamp Water Trophy to the Quiplash series and Pack 3 for winning amongst everyone else. To everyone who worked on Quiplash and Pack 3, please take a piece of this trophy for yourself. Embrace with the beauty of premium virtual gold and admire the pixels making up the composition of this trophy. And now that I've taken my several month break from FNF, I guess it's time to continue working on my mod ranking video. <sighs> See you probably in a decade. Adios.